well, it was suggested that I uh, study the theory of superconductivity. Um, of course, superconductivity is a, an extremely intriguing phenomenon. I even read about it when I was in school, and uh, uh, so I was intrigued as to how it was explained. And I um, looked at the various approaches, and um, a number of them seemed to talk about um, there being a phase associated with a superconductor. One is Phil Anderson's idea of um, pseudo spins. He had a, a picture where spins were in a particular plane which could point in any direction. Um, Gorkov had a, an anomalous wave function, as he called it, which had a phase. So I had the idea well, if there's a phase, then maybe you get persistent currents because when you go around a, a circuit, the phase changes by 2 pi, and you, you can't alter that. Um, it's a, it has to be an integer number, and you can't alter that if you, uh, by any manipulations, you do. So that will be a persistent current. And then, if somehow you impose a phase difference, uh, that produces an asymmetry, which that provides an asymmetry, which can tell the electrons which way to go. First of all, absolute phase you can never measure, but phase difference you might be able to measure. But then there's another symmetry principle which said the only condition under which phase difference could matter uh, would be if electrons could move from one system to another. So uh, that produced the idea if uh, two systems can exchange electrons and they have different phases, then the current will know which way to go. It provides a measure of a phase. However, I did see um, a paper by Shapiro et al. with junctions with uh, normal metal in between that did show uh, supercurrent as well, and I thought, aha, maybe this is it. Of course, around about that time, actually, um, uh, flux quantization was observed, uh, which confirmed the idea, and I realized that this all slotted in. If you have a superconducting uh, ring structure, you know that the uh, magnetic flux enclosed by the ring, if it's in the superconducting state, is uh, quantized in units of the flux quantum, phi naught. It's 2 times 10 minus 15 tesla meter squared, roundabout. And this is due to the fact that the superconducting wave function can only change its phase by uh, an integral number of 2 pi when you walk around the ring. And the phase change when going around the ring is directly connected to the magnetic flux that you enclose in the, uh, in the superconductor. Brian Pippard came to me one day and showing this uh, ingenious experiment of Gaver. Uh, he, he could measure the um, energy gap without microwaves or anything, just measuring a voltage. Gaber had seen the, uh, the supercurrents. He occasionally saw um, currents at zero voltage and assumed then it was uh, just a short circuit. Uh, I think there was quite a bit of talk of short circuits, some of them which may have been actual tunneling junctions. Uh, he also noticed that when he turned the switch and there was a magnetic field that it altered the current, but he thought, well, this is just some freak of the apparatus, so he didn't investigate. So it's clear, though, that he had seen it in his junctions. I then got to thinking, well, um, the phase should affect the coherence factor. Um, uh, at least what would determine the coherence factor would be the phase difference, and, but perhaps there isn't a well-defined phase difference, so that would explain it all. Well, this is an example of what they call a proximity effect, where proximity, here you might say that the proximity of a superconductor is making normal metal act like a superconductor. Well, you can get the reverse situation where um, if there's a lot of normal metal close to a little bit of superconductor, then the normal metal suppresses the superconductor. And the reason why you get these proximity effects is the electrons move about, and there's a distance they call the coherence length, which sort of says how far these coherence influences go. Coherence length was the distance to which, through which a change uh, would spread. If you tried to change the superconductor at one point, it would spread through a distance xi. So um, you, you can get um, suppression of superconductivity in this way, if, if conditions are right. So what is the Joulson junction? So the Joulson junction basically are two superconducting electrodes coupled via the weak link. And what is the weak link? So it can be a tunnel barrier. In this case, this is a tunnel junction. 
It can be a normal metal, in this case is a proximity uh, junction, for example SNS junction, or it can be a weak link, so a uh, tiny superconducting constriction. To me, the Johnson effect is interesting from several perspectives. First of all, it is a, one of the most interesting phenomena, physical phenomena, uh, related to superconductivity. Second, it is a building brick for any cryoelectronic device. So what we can say that, well, as far as the market is concerned, it's probably the second after high power applications. Two of the most important equations that came out was, first of all, the fact that the current is proportional to the sign of a phase difference. And the other, which comes out of symmetry principles, is to say that the time dependence of a phase difference is proportional to the voltage, um, the voltage cross of junction. Uh, in fact, it's 2 EV over H. If the first equation is uh, more or less straightforward and, and understandable, I want to emphasize that the second equation is not trivial at all. It means that whenever we have a DC, I emphasize that this is a DC voltage across the Johnson junction, the phase is changing with time, and from the first equation we see that the change in time of phase means that the current is oscillating. So whenever we have a DC voltage, superconducting current is oscillating like this, while the voltage is constant. So very unusual situation for conventional electronics. So how can we interpret this uh, second AC Johnson equation? Well, the interpretation, in fact, is very simple. What happens is that uh, upon tunneling of a Cooper pair with a charge 2E, so this guy here, from left to right, it acquires the energy 2EV. So this is just the energy which is acquired. And this energy is radiated as a quantum of electromagnetic radiation. Two regimes, one a DC current with no voltage, which is like an ordinary supercurrent, and the other one is a finite voltage. There's something w which won't show up in an ordinary experiment. It's uh, an oscillating current. I'm not sure whether you've seen the pendulum analog or not. Capacitance in the junction is, corresponds to the moment of inertia of this moving uh, system. And the conductance in the circuit corresponds to the damping. The uh, critical current of the junction corresponds to the length of the pendulum arm times the pendulum bob mass times gravitational constant. The angular velocity is the an analog of voltage. So it goes up and faster and slower and faster and slower and so on. So those are the ripples on top. And then you turn off the drive current and it falls. And it goes back and forth like that. And those are what are called plasma oscillations in the junction, uh, a damped Junction. So what happens then when you apply the excessive critical current, it goes over the top, but then it just, it, you hit it with a pulse, and it goes over the top, and then doesn't do a lot of this uh, plasma oscillation because of the damping. The difference between Aprikosov and Josephson vortices, a Josephson vortex lives in a Josephson junction. So in an SIS junction, you have magnetic field in the insulating layer and it's shielded by a circulating current which across the barrier is the tunneling current and inside the bulk of the electrodes it's just a bulk current. Now, the current density, the shielding current density is much, much smaller because the chosen current, the critical current is much smaller than the circulating current around an, the current density ar around an upper course of vortex which typically is the dipairing current. That's one difference. The size is another difference because as the current density is smaller, the shielding length becomes larger. And for the Josephson vortex, it's the Josephson penetration depth, which easily is a few micrometers as compared to a few hundred nanometers. And finally, because the Josephson vortex lives inside the barrier, it hasn't, doesn't have to break up the superconducting condensate and create a normal core. The core is already normal which means 
that if it moves, it doesn't have to break up the condensate. It can move much, much faster. The motion is much less bent. Okay, so, so what's important is the magnetic flux in the junction, um, not so much the magnetic field. Okay. This we're going to think of as being rather like a single slit in optics. Yep. So in an optics, the equivalent thing would be to have a slit that looked like that. Yep. And then we shine our light coming this way. So this is some here. monochromatic. So there'd be some monochromatic light, yes. Okay. So this is plotting the intensity along this way, and this would be in the question of optics, some kind of angle theta, and that's our central position there. So that's what you see on the screen. And that's what you see on the screen. And we know from, from our optical diffraction that the position of this minimum depends inversely on the size of this slit. So for a very big slit, these fringes are spaced very close together. Yes, and for a very small and slit, they're spaced much farther apart. Okay. Okay, well the same thing happens with the um, superconducting junction. In fact, you can pretty much just replace the intensity with the critical current okay. and the angle with the magnetic field you've applied. So now, now what do these minima correspond to? Right, these minima now correspond to the number of flux quanta that you have in the junction's area. And in fact, the first minima corresponds to having a flux, one single flux quanta minute, phi naught. That corresponds to having two phi naught, and likewise, on so that way, the field just going the other direction.